Today we're on Psalm 14, and the time is flying by since we started this series uh, on the Psalms, a Psalm per day, and now we're on Psalm 14. If you open your Bibles to Psalm 14, verse 1 says, The fool has said in his heart, There is no God. So here we get the biblical definition of a fool. A fool is someone who doesn't believe in God, has no faith in God, says that God does not exist, either uh, mentally, uh, even may profess that with his lips, or in just his practical lifestyle, a practical atheist. Even if you have a statement of faith of, in God somewhere, but you live as the wicked live, you're living a practically atheist life. But um, when it says the fool has said in his heart, there is no God, fool here doesn't mean someone who is uh, mentally deficient or uh, you know, it's not that smart or whatever. That's not the idea of fool. In fact, someone can be an atheist and be very smart. And you see this with the uh, so-called new atheists. Some of them are, uh, as, as humans go, brilliant men. It's a very strident form of atheism. Uh, ones like uh, Richard Dawkins and um, Sam Harris, uh, Daniel Dennett, and now Christopher Hitchens, who has gone to his reward. Uh, that they are smart men. They are smart men. Uh, so it's not um, speaking of intelligence. In fact, I have a little poem in my Bible. It goes like this. A man may store his mind with facts. The knowledge from it overflows. But without Christ, his life to guide, he's still a fool, whatever he knows. And uh, those are our true words. So here we get, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. And this is what I was talking about, the practical atheism. It's not just even professing to be an atheist, but if you live in a way, uh, uh, in wickedness, if you live uh, a sinful lifestyle and so on, basically, no matter what you're professing, you're, you're, you're practically an atheist. You're living in a way that says God doesn't really exist. He doesn't see. He will not judge. And... Um, we got here in uh, verses uh, 2 uh, to 3, or maybe down to verse 4, and the end of verse 1, um, what we call the depravity of man, the doctrine of the depravity of man. Now, when we think of that uh, term, sometimes people have the idea of the depravity of man as, you know, someone who is a you know, serial killer or, you know, the... Uh, Jason on Friday the 13th or the Texas uh, Chainsaw Massacre or whatever. But that's not what the Bible is saying about um, uh, when it uh, brings out the doctrine of the total depravity of man. Um, although men can actually get to that point uh, when they do such things. Uh, but the, the depravity of man is not that every man is, is as bad as he could be, but no man is as good as he should be that we have all sinned and come short uh, of the glory of God. Now, this is what uh, the psalmist brings out in verse 2, 3, and 4. Uh, the Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek uh, God. They are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. Uh, actually, the margin here has stinking. Uh, there is none that doeth good, no, not one. And uh, actually, these verses are quoted by the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 3, where he's proving that indeed all men have come short of the glory of God. All men have sinned in Romans 3.23. Uh, but if we just uh, back up uh, a few verses, he's, he says, um, the Bible has proved and concluded all are under sin, both Jew and Gentile. Then we get verse 10. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not, not one. There is none that understands. There is none that seeks after God. For they have all gone out of the way, they're all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. And then he goes on from quoting other verses from the Old Testament and from the law and from the Psalms to prove the sinfulness of man. Uh, and then he concludes with that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. And then, of course, he's not just uh, pointing out the sinfulness of man just to point it out. He's pointing it out so we also may bring in the solution which is the propitiation, the sacrifice, death, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus, his propitiation. You satisfy God with respect to the question of sin. In verse uh, 24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, 
whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, and so on. We can't take time to go into the doctrine of justification and propitiation of substitution. But first we have to realize that, that we are sinners. That's the first step. Uh, and once we realize that, God has given a remedy. And then uh, if we uh, drop down in the psalm, uh, we get uh, verse 7, the last verse, which actually is looking uh, to the future. It's a prophecy about the future restoration of Israel. Uh, verse 7 says, Oh, that salvation, the salvation of Israel were come out of Zion, when the Lord brings back the captivity of his people. Jacob shall rejoice, and Israel shall be glad. Now, if you would look in the uh, ESV translation, it puts it this way. Uh, oh, that the salvation of Israel were come out of Zion, uh, when the Lord restores uh, the fortunes of his people when he restores the fortunes of his people. This uh, verse, verse 7, uh, is uh, quoted again by the Apostle Paul in Romans 11. Actually, Paul is actually probably quoting more from Isaiah 59, or he's splicing the two verses together. Isaiah uh, 59, verse 20, where he says, The Redeemer shall come uh, to Zion, and to them that turn from transgression uh, in Jacob, says the Lord. But if we turn over to Romans uh, chapter 11, uh, we'll just look at verse 25. Uh, For I would not uh, you to be ignorant, brethren, that you should be ignorant of uh, this mystery, uh, lest you should be wise in your own conceits. He's speaking to the Gentile Christians, not to be puffed up and to think that, you know, God has now rejected Israel and uh, they have no more future and think that we are the be-all and end-all. We're not. For blindness or hardness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles is come in. In other words, when all the Gentiles have been brought in in this age, in this dispensation, and then will come the rapture, God will turn again to the people of Israel. Verse 26, he quotes Isaiah uh, 59 and uh, Psalm 14. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, their enemies for your sake, that's Israel's present state. But as uh, concerning the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake. God made certain promises to Abraham, and they're unconditional. And he will, in the future, restore uh, the people of Israel. It's interesting when we think of Zion. Um, Zion is the city of Jerusalem. Here, uh, it says that, that salvation may come out of Zion. And you know what it will. When God restores the people of Israel, Christ will reign over Jerusalem, reign over Israel, reign over the world, reign over the heavens. But uh, Jerusalem shall be the center of his earthly rule. The, the knowledge of the, of the law of God and the knowledge of God and the glory of God will go out from Jerusalem to all the corners of the earth in a way that it's not today. And so salvation will literally come out of Zion to the nations. But we see in Psalm 2, it says of uh, the Lord's anointed, um, in Psalm 2, that I have set my, my king, my anointed, upon my holy hill of Zion. There we see that Christ the Messiah, he's upon Zion, upon the holy hill of Zion. Here we see he comes out of Zion, or salvation uh, comes out of Zion. Uh, Isaiah 59 I believe the reference there speaks of uh, him, the Redeemer shall come to Zion. So the Redeemer, the Messiah, will come first to Zion, and then he will set or sit upon Zion, and then the salvation uh, for all the ends of the earth will go out of Zion. And then we get another verse in um, uh, the Psalms. I believe it's uh, Psalm 48. I may be mistaken there, where it speaks of walking around a Zion and beholding its to its towers, and that will be in the millennium. I may have the wrong reference there. I'm just going by memory here, but you may want to look it up. Uh, when we walk about Zion and we behold its towers, oh, dear friends, all these things will come to pass. So let us walk in faith, uh, faith in the living God. The Lord Jesus said, even though uh, you don't see me, you believe. It says that in First Peter, and the Lord Jesus could say to uh, Thomas. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed.